Our sermon text this morning is John 16, verses 25 to the end of the chapter. Before I read, let me give you just a bit of context. Jesus is just hours from his arrest and crucifixion. He's been talking to his 11 remaining disciples about his departure, about the coming of the Holy Spirit. In fact, earlier in this chapter, he's given them somewhat of a a cryptic saying about his death and resurrection. He, He has said, a little while and you will see me no more. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And so we pick up in verse 25, and as I read these words, remember that this is God's holy and inspired and inerrant word written for you and for me this morning. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world." Amen. Please be seated. And let us pray for the Lord's help as we consider his word. Let's pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, you are the one who enables us to know your love and to love in the midst of a hostile world. You are the one who by the power of the Holy Spirit enables us more and more to rejoice even in the midst of sorrow, and you are the one who enables us to take heart even in the midst of tribulation. Father, you do this because of the the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one born of woman, the the one born under the law, that he might redeem those under the law and make us sons and daughters of God. Lord, we pray that as we turn our attention to your word, You would enable us to see something of the glory of Jesus Christ in his death and his resurrection for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We are living now in the year 2023. Uh, For those of us who grew up in the 1900s, and isn't that a very flattering way to put it, it's amazing that we're living in 2023. Can Can you believe it? And yet that's not quite right, is it? It's actually 2023 A.D., Anno Domini, which is Latin for the year of the Lord. You often hear the phrase, in the year of our Lord, incidentally, because when this dating method was conceived by a Christian monk in the 6th century A.D., the original phrase was, in the year of our Lord Jesus Christ, Anno Domini Nostri Jesu Christi. I can remember being a young boy, being amazed to learn that that no matter who you are or or where you live or even what your religious beliefs are, uh, virtually the whole world dates human history to the time before the coming of Christ in his birth, B.C., and the time after his birth, A.D., Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. Now, you may know that scholars tell us that, that Jesus was actually born probably around 4 B.C., so the dating method is not exactly right, but, but close enough. Uh, cl- cl- close enough. This is the Western dating system. This is now the, the international standard for dating years and centuries and millennia. Legal documents cite it. Scholars use it. Scientific calculations depend on it. Uh, think of everything in our world that depends on this dating system. Governments, holidays, international trade, schools, planning, budgets, record keeping, everything we use. All the way down to the calendars on our phone, keeping track of of 
anniversaries and birthdays and dentist appointments. It's all dependent upon this Anno Domini uh, dating system. Even the way our Bibles are arranged are structured this way. The, the, the books of the Old Testament record the time B.C., before the coming of Christ. Uh, the New Testament records A.D. And this is all extraordinarily fitting, isn't it? Because if it's true, if it's really true, that the divine Son of God took on flesh and entered our world, well, then there is no greater bisection of human history, is there? Everything that came before the birth of Christ was leading up to it. Everything that has happened since has happened in light of it. And so we can really say that, 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 that this is the great centerpiece of human history. And, and yet I would submit to you that, that if we ask Jesus what his preferred dating system would be, it actually would not center on his birth. Now, this is not because Jesus was somehow in the dark about the significance of his birth. He hardly was. But I believe that Jesus would say that the great bisection of human history is actually not his birth, but his resurrection. His resurrection. This is the thing that has changed everything, isn't it? This is what has changed world history. This is what has changed redemptive history, as we're going to see. This is what ought to change our personal history. So it's 2023 Anno Domini, but it's really roughly 2023 Anno Resurrectionis Domini, in the year of the resurrection of our Lord. I mentioned earlier that we are in this time period at the end of Jesus' ministry on earth with his disciples, the end of the upper room discourse. He's been talking to his disciples about the future, and he's been talking to them specifically about the time after his resurrection. This is what he's doing in our text this morning. And just to, just to support this context a bit that he's talking about the resurrection, let me re recall here that back in verse 22, he has said this, you will have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice. And this is what happened when Jesus appeared to them as risen from the dead. They rejoiced. And then even in our text, in verse, in verse 28, he says, I came from the Father, have come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. He's going to go to the Father through the cross and then the resurrection. In our text this morning, Jesus therefore identifies four things. Uh, four things about this Anno Resurrectionis Domini, the year, the time between the resurrection and his return. Four things that are changed in light of his being raised from the dead. And, and I believe that if we can get these things into our own bloodstream, you will see how the resurrection of Jesus Christ must transform our own personal calendar as well. The first thing that Jesus says is that the time after his resurrection will be a day of unprecedented clarity. Unprecedented clarity. He says in verse 25, I've said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. Again, he's talking about the time of his earthly ministry versus the time after his resurrection. Jesus says, I've been speaking in figures of speech. Of course, Jesus has been teaching them in parables from time to time, but also in puzzling symbols and phrases. Just in John's gospel, he's described himself as the source of living water. He has told his hearers that he is the bread from heaven. He told Nicodemus in, in chapter 3 that you have to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. He's told his hearers in Jerusalem that if they tear down the temple, he can rebuild it in three days, speaking of the temple of his body. He's told his disciples that he is the good shepherd who knows his sheep by name, who will lead them out into green pasture. To all this, the disciples were, were a bit confused. They, they knew that he was the Messiah. They knew that he was coming to establish a kingdom. But we see again and again that they didn't really understand that Jesus had to die, and they really didn't understand that he would rise from the dead. When Jesus spoke the words about being the good shepherd back in chapter 10, we read in verse 6 of that chapter, this figure of speech Jesus used with them. It's the same word in, in verse 25 of our text. This figure of speech he used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. 
Now, Jesus would take them aside and he would explain the parables. He would answer their questions. He would give fuller explanation. Occasionally, Jesus would rebuke his disciples for not recognizing what he was saying, particularly in the light of the Old Testament. But at the same time, Jesus understood that fuller light was coming. A clearer light of the significance of his person and work was coming on the far side of his resurrection. The event that signals this is really the gift of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit gets poured out from heaven upon the church, the disciples become changed men. We see this in the way that they preach in the Gospel of Acts, don't we? But already, Jesus has said in this chapter to them, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Then he says in chapter 16, verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Oh, this is what happened. And Jesus rose from the dead, and and first he spent 40 days with his disciples, appearing to them many times. The beginning of Acts says he taught them about the kingdom of God. It was an intense time of theological training where, where the dots were connected, where they understood what Jesus had done. They understood that his cross was an atonement for sin. They understood that he was risen risen as the Savior of the world. Then the Holy Spirit gets poured out. They begin to understand how the Old Testament pointed to Jesus, how everything was leading up to the moment in which they were living. And there are a number of applications of this unprecedented clarity of the gospel on this side of the resurrection for you and for me today. The first is this. That what Jesus was doing with his disciples in his earthly ministry, leading them into the unprecedented clarity of gospel revelation, well, this is what God has been doing throughout human history. The Bible records not only the beginning of human history and creation, not only the fall of our first father into sin, which is what Aaron has been preaching about from Romans 5, but it records that in the wake of the catastrophic fall, God gave a first gospel promise. All the way back in Genesis 3, verse 15, God said that there would would come from the woman a seed, a champion seed, who would crush the head of the serpent. And this is what theologians call the proto-gospel. This is the first gospel promise. This This is the light of redemption beginning to shine. And then throughout the Old Testament history, through the promises Through the covenants, the light grows brighter. Until at last, Jesus arrives in the flesh. He lives and dies and rises. And it's like the full flower of God's plan of salvation has opened up. It's like the full sun is shining in its strength. So that we who live on this side of the resurrection can open our Bibles. And we can say, yes, Lord, I see now what you've been doing from beginning to now. The Apostle Paul understood this. He who was the last of all the apostles, he said, the mystery of Christ, this is in Ephesians chapter 3, the mystery of Christ was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now Paul understood that the gospel was revealed in prior generations. He wasn't denying that. It was revealed in in types and shadows and symbols But Paul understood that he was living at the turning point of the ages and that it was his privilege to proclaim this fully revealed gospel to the whole world. Not only does this help us understand our Bibles, but it has immediate application for us today, and that is this. The Christian faith is a revealed faith. The Christian faith is a revealed faith. That is to say, there are no dark sayings. There are no hidden secrets when it comes to the gospel. God said in Isaiah 45, 19, I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. People today ask, where where can I find God? God is not known anywhere. Where can I find him? We must be agnostic. No. The Bible says you can find God in the things that he has made. He reveals his power, his righteousness, his wisdom in the world at large. But we especially find God in the pages of Scripture where the gospel of our salvation is revealed, where the risen Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, uses the very words of the Bible, in the very words of the Bible, to reveal the Father's will to us. 
And what is the Father's will? It is that we would all repent of our sin and receive and rest in Jesus Christ as he is offered in the gospel. You remember when the Apostle Paul goes to Athens and he's preaching to uh, pagan philosophers and he says this, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And then Paul says this, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Friends, if you are here this morning in God's providence and you are still looking for God, you need to know that he's not hiding. He is not running. Maybe what you need to do again is humble yourself under the word of God and say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And God will do for you what he's done for so many, take you from a position of relative obscurity regarding the gospel to delight in the unprecedented clarity of the gospel revealed in Jesus Christ. And if you do that, I think you will discover the second thing that Jesus says in our text this morning, that in this age of the resurrection of our Lord, it will be a day of unhindered access to the Father unhindered access. Notice he says in verse 26, in that day. Again, what day? Well, the day of his resurrection. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. Now when Jesus says in verse 26, I will not ask the Father on your behalf, I believe he's recalling the way that that Old Testament Israel had to approach God. You remember that in the Old Testament period, the average Jew could not just boldly enter into the presence of God as he had determined to meet with them in the temple, in the tabernacle. In fact, the very architecture of the temple communicated that there, that there was an indirect way of approach to God. The people of God had to approach him by way of a human priest. Indeed, only the high priest could enter into the temple itself and move from that first room, the, the holy place, where there was the lampstand and the bread and the altar of incense, and pass beyond a very thick curtain into the most holy place, the place where the Ark of the Covenant rested, the place where the mercy seat was, the place where he was to sprinkle the blood of sacrifice, the place where God would meet with his people. All of this was carefully choreographed because of the holiness of God. And you remember what happened when Jesus died on the cross. As the judgment of God was poured out upon him for sin, not his own. As the sun was blotted out in noonday darkness. That very curtain separating the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two from top to bottom. It was a symbol of many things. But one of the things that it symbolized is that the way into the very presence of God was now opened because of the death of Jesus Christ. So we can say today, for all who believe on Jesus, we don't need an Old Testament priest anymore because Jesus is our priest. The Bible says that after he rose from the dead, Jesus ascended into the heavenly temple, into the original temple, into the one of which the earthly temple was but a copy. And Jesus has thrown wide the doors of heaven for all who believe on him. We don't need an Old Testament priest. We don't even need a Roman Catholic priest. This is the Protestant doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, that we have unhindered access to our Father. We can go to him. We can spread our prayers before him, our anxieties and cares before him not only in light of the full revelation of the gospel, but in light of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, as Old Testament priests did, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. Now, Jesus doesn't mean that the Father loves us only after we believe in Jesus, Rather, he means that if we love Jesus, 
the Father welcomes us. The Father welcomes us. Jesus is saying, when I ascend to the Father, I will be with him, but I will not have to persuade the Father to be gracious to you because the Father has already loved you from before the foundation of the world. The Father is the one who sent me to be your Redeemer. The Father is the one who delights to hear the prayers of his children. There was a theologian uh, back at Princeton Seminary in the 1800s named Charles Hodge. Uh, Charles Hodge was a tremendous intellect. He was a gigantic theologian. His nickname was the Lion of Princeton. And he lived on campus, and he had two doors in his study. <clears throat> One door was to the outside that students could use to come in and see their professor. And the other door was on the inside where his family could come in. And Hodge famously realized that his children had trouble turning the doorknob of the door to the inside. And so he had the hinges replaced with, with swinging hinges so his children could simply open the door and visit their father in his study. Well, we can say today that Jesus has done that and more, hasn't he? Because what Jesus has done is he enters into the heavenly temple is he, he takes the doors off completely. He opens the way to heaven for sinners. Hebrews 10 says we can have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through his flesh. And so the author of Hebrews says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. So the question for us this morning is, are we, are we taking advantage of the unhindered access that we have to the Father? And Jesus says there's only one condition. We must come to the Father in his name. We must come to the Father through Christ because he is the only mediator between God and man. So when we pray, we must pray in the name of Jesus. All other prayer, however it may sound, it may be to an imagined God, a figment of our imagination, but when we pray to the Father of Jesus Christ through the mediation of Jesus Christ, that is prayer that always enters the Father's presence. One writer, Gordon Ketty, says this, Christless prayer is godless prayer, however pious it may sound. Christless prayer is godless prayer, however pious it may sound. That's true. However, the converse is also true. Christ-mediated prayer is prayer that the Father loves, no matter how stammering or stumbling it may sound. If we take advantage of the unhindered access that we have through Jesus Christ, we will need to cry out to God because of the third thing that Jesus says. Not only is this Anno Resurrectionis Domini, this year of the resurrection of our Lord, a time of unprecedented clarity and unhindered access to the Father, Jesus says it is a time of spiritual opposition. Spiritual opposition. Well, where did this come from? Things were going so well. But look at what Jesus says. In verse 28, he gives this sweeping summary of his ministry. And notice he says, I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. Let's just appreciate here how much Jesus is saying here. He's, he's referencing his deity. I've come from the Father. He's mentioning his incarnation. I've come into the world. He mentions his death and, and resurrection. I'm leaving the world. And he references his ascension. I'm going to the Father. And no sooner does he say this than, than the disciples think that the day of unprecedented clarity has already come. He doesn't even need to go to the cross. They offer this real confession of faith in verse 29. They say, we believe that you came from God. But notice in light of what Jesus has said, uh, this is only a, a partial confession. Uh, they haven't yet grasped what it means for Jesus to be leaving the world and going to the Father. 
They haven't yet grasped the significance of, of the cross of Jesus, not only for him, but also for them. And so Jesus says in verse 31, do you now believe? Jesus is saying essentially, you think you believe well now, do you? This is a subtle rebuke. One, one writer says the word now is the equivalent of a raised eyebrow. And Jesus is saying you're getting out over your skis a little bit. Not so fast. You, you don't believe the way that you think you do because my cross is about to show what it really means to believe in me. Arthur Pink says, it's one thing to know the soldier's drill and wear the uniform. It's quite another to be steadfast in the day of battle. So Jesus says in verse 32, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. This is a reminder that Jesus' triumph over sin and death and hell at the cross was the very moment when the full fury of Satan and hell and death was laid against him. And it was therefore the moment where the temptation to shrink back and fall away was great for the disciples. But here's the thing. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ and before his return, Jesus has made it clear that the hostility against him and his cause will continue until he comes again. He has said earlier in chapter 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So Christians ask themselves, how can this be? How, how can it be that Jesus is on his throne and yet I experience such spiritual struggle? How can Jesus be risen and I commit the same sin that I've committed so many times? How can Jesus be risen and the church experience such spiritual depression and be so weak in prayer? And Christians have asked this question so much that, that in the history of the church, some have proposed entire theological systems to suggest that, well, Jesus really isn't reigning yet. He's going to reign maybe for a thousand years at some indeterminate time in the future, but he's not reigning yet. And this is what those systems, and often we ourselves, often miss. It's that the time of Christ's triumph in this age is the time of the church's testing. The time of Christ's triumph in this age is the time of, Christ's, of the church's testing. And why is this the case? It is because in the inscrutable wisdom of God, he has determined not only to unite you to Jesus Christ through faith, but to forge you into the image of Jesus through the spiritual struggles that you endure. God has determined that you endure trials by faith in Jesus as you follow in his footsteps in route to resurrection glory. God is using all of the spiritual stresses and pressures and, and anxieties and fears of living in this fallen world as you give them to your Father in heaven through Jesus. He is leading you to resurrection glory with Jesus. So James says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Well, we live in an age of unprecedented clarity of gospel revelation. This year of the resurrection of our Lord means unhindered access to the Father. But here's the question, what is going to keep us steadfast in this age of spiritual opposition and struggle. I submit to you that it's the fourth and final thing that Jesus says here, that in the year of the resurrection of our Lord, it will be a time of assured victory. Whenever you need encouragement for fighting against sin, whenever you need endurance for living for God and not for yourself, 
whenever you need to endure heartache and live with and for joy in the Holy Spirit, you can come back to verse 33. Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. With these words, we see that Jesus doesn't rebuke his disciples for getting out over their skis in order to shake his finger at them and shame them. No, he he does it to remind them that where they fail, he will succeed. Where they fall, he will stand. For as he says in verse 32, the Father is always with him. And as he goes to the cross, as he goes to the tomb, because he is the righteous one, Death cannot hold him. He is risen from the, from the dead in glory and power. And even before he goes to the cross, notice in verse 33, he speaks in the past tense. He says, I have overcome the world. So sure, so certain is the Father's plan of salvation. So obedient unto death is the Father's Son in our flesh. Jesus can say, I have overcome the world. And these very words are fuel for the Christian life, are they not? They are fuel for the Christian life because because those who are weak in faith still place their weak faith in a strong and secure Savior. We still place our faith, however weak it may be, in the Savior whose victory overcomes the world. And we can know that as we pass in Through the footsteps of Jesus, as we endure opposition from this fallen world, as we face the sins of our own heart, we know that Jesus already shares his resurrection life with us through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us and ultimately on the last day. So Jesus says, you will face tribulation. He says it. It's an old word. It's sometimes translated in this world, you you will have trouble. It can, mean, it can mean persecution from without. It can mean everything up to and including death. It can mean struggles with our own heart. It can mean anything and everything that we endure as we live in this year of the resurrection of our Lord before his glorious return. Paul says in Acts 14, verse 22, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. There are no secrets, no hidden sayings. No deceptive rhetoric. But when we face such tribulation, Jesus says we can take heart. We can have courage. Our hearts can remain firm. We we don't have to be depressed or despairing because we are joined to the risen Christ now and forever through faith in him. So we sing, soar we now where Christ has led, following our exalted head. Made like him, like him we rise. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. As Jesus suffered unto glory, so those who are joined to him suffer unto glory, and they do so as those in whom his resurrection life has already begun. John got it. The apostle John who wrote these words wrote epistles toward the end of the New Testament. And in 1 John 5, we started our service preparing for worship with these verses. In 1 John 5, verse 4, John says this, This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now we read these words, this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And we think to ourselves, How can my faith overcome the world? My my faith can barely overcome the alarm clock in the morning. (laughs) But again, it's not because our faith is strong. It's because the object of our faith is strong. He is the one who is strong and secure and saving. One of my favorite theologians, we'll close with this, one of my favorite theologians is, is named Herman Bovink. He's a Dutch theologian. He's now long with the Lord. When he was 24 years old, he preached his first sermon. And it was on 1 John 5, 4. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. He 
He titled his sermon, The World Conquering Power of Faith. And as we close, I just want to read you a few portions of his sermon, and then we'll pray. Bob Inc. writes, Faith is the only weapon John gives us with which to fight against the schemes, temptations, and lies of the world. It is the only means at our disposal for overcoming destruction and death. History witnesses to the world-conquering power of faith. How? Because it maintains that Jesus is the Son of God who is now risen from the dead. There is no strength in us or in any creature in heaven and on the earth, but Jesus, the Son of Mary, the only begotten of the Father, He is the hero of Judah's line who conquered the world through his cross. And through this, through its content and object, is faith precisely a world-conquering power. By faith, we enter into Christ's work. We rest on his victory. We receive his merits. Here is a fight in which the victory is assured. Christ is the guarantee of this. The nations have been given to him as his inheritance, and the ends of the earth as his possession. Later he will come in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, but to be glorified in his saints, and to be marveled at among all who have believed. Come then, Lord Jesus. Yes, come quickly. Amen. Brothers and sisters, may you live in the clarity of gospel revelation on this side of the cross. May you delight in your unhindered access to the Father through faith in Jesus, the only mediator between God and man. And as you face whatever obstacles you are facing this morning, may you know through the resurrection power of Jesus that his and therefore your victory is assured. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you would take this word from the lips of our Lord and apply them deeply to our hearts. Lord, we pray that we would endure, not because our faith is strong, but because the object of our faith is strong. And we thank you that he indeed has already conquered this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.